Hello everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Today we're sitting down with Blake Quarter. Hello. Howdy. Thank you for joining us. It's a real pleasure. We're at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software. We're on day two-ish, three-ish now, and this is our second conversation after Ping Fu. So I'm really excited to talk to you. Blake is the head of software research, research. software research at Stratasys. He's been there four years now. And previously at, oh, was it OpenCAD? GrabCAD. GrabCAD, and sold, or was part of the team that sold that about six years ago now. Four, well, four years ago, but six years ago you started it, so you were working on it. So, so, sorry, I was not a founder of, of GrabCAD. I, I joined the team relatively early to help them build their first commercial product. Yes. And then it was really, it, it was uh, Hardy Maybaum and John Stevenson who really led the initiative to, to, to transition it to make the difference in additive manufacturing. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about additive manufacturing, 3D printing. We're going to be talking about the impact that that has on the world in all of the different ways. And then we'll maybe jump into some simulation questions at the end. So tell us a little bit about the life journey. What kind of got you into, because you were at Princeton, uh, what got you into even engineering in the first place and then into 3D printing? Okay, you've done your research. Um, Apparently not. I missed so many things <laughs> in the first time. Um, you know, I that, that I started. I went into en engineering school because, um, well, at Princeton, it's an extra thing to apply for, and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to study math or engineering. And I figured, and so the obvious thing was to you know apply for the, the one that will get you both. And pretty early on, um, I unfortunately got turned off from math. I had a phenomenal professor, but I didn't I didn't like the subject matter, and. Um, and I ended up really enjoying engineering design. I was starting to use CAD. I deployed Pro Engineer there and found it to be fascinating. And I, and I was also really enjoying programming computer graphics. So once, once I saw Pro Engineer, I, I, the only job I applied for was, was PTC. It was, they were the leaders at the time. And um, so that's where I, I got started in the industry. Um, I was at PTC for six years. I had a good career. I started as a sales engineer, worked my way up through product management. I was running business development for the mechanical division when I left. And the reason I left was PTC does amazing things. They're, they're, they're still a great company. But I found, I, I wanted to solve some very specific problems in geometric modeling to make, to make CAD systems more available. Um, what we found was that that, that, that that generation of CAD tools was really needed to be used by dedicated trained folks. And I thought everyone should be able to express their ideas in 3D and work with the 3D information. Sort of, some people might use the, the awkward word democratization yep. to talk about this. And, and, and there'd been some inspiration. There was a product called SketchUp that was on the market that was an architectural product that showed there was a way, a much, much easier paradigm. And we, we wanted to make that available for precise solid models like the mechanical industry needs. So I started that company. Um, and after a little while, I hired a guy by the name of, uh, I started with David Taylor, who's another phenomenal guy in the industry. Um, Mike Payne became our first CEO and made the product real. And then a guy by the name of Chris Randalls, so all these folks have been to COFES, uh, became the second CEO, or I guess the third CEO after me, to, um, to make it commercially successful, and that was acquired by ANSYS. So that was about a 10-year journey for me. Um, startups have ups and downs. They're not for the faint and the heart. I learned a lot of lessons the hard way. Yep. Um, but I also learned a lot of really Im incredibly important skills and made a lot of connections during that time. Definitely. And one thing I didn't realize is that just repeating a message tirelessly um, that you really believe in, it takes a long time or it feels like a long time, but you change the way people think. And I feel like the contribution I was able to make during that phase of my life was the industry said, wait a minute, we do need to make these tools easier. easier. And every CAD vendor did work in that direction. So the whole industry moved just because we thought you know, we had this one little idea. And I think that, the, that, that, I think that, 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 that wave has kind of run its course. But um, it, it, I think that's, it was, it, I, I, that was the first time I was the only, that I really was able to create an impact. And, and look, is, is it a big deal? Is it, is it earth shattering? More people can do solid modeling. It's, it's, it's fun and commercially important. But, but for me, I think, you know, help people go home and see their, their kids a little bit earlier. You know, less frustration with the mm. tools. It, it, mm -hmm. These little, the little things that you've gotten frustrated at software it makes your blood boil a little bit. Just taking some of that away. Mm -hmm. You know, it, yeah. We made, so we improve people's quality of life a little mm -hmm. bit. Decrease the learning curve. There's so many important things to do yeah, in yeah. this process. 
So, so, so space claim, was, I put about 10 years into space claim, and I think that, I, I believe you only get one shot at this thing, and so I think that it's enough of life to put into one project. And so I, I, I ended up moving on to GrabCAD, um, because those guys were doing something really amazing. They had created a community of mechanical engineers, and it turns out there, there's a pent-up need for folk, because mechanical engineers is a creative activity. People create things, and they want to share them. And we just created a place where people could share what they do and talk to each other. So it's what a they community. Do. It's a community of mechanical CAD users. Cool. And there, there's just amazing need for it. And once you have one of those, everyone comes to it. So it's like the LinkedIn for mechanical design. Nice. And I, I was actually one of the first members on this site. I was so excited about it myself. Good. And, and then when I had the opportunity to join the company to build their first commercial product, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was amazing to join John and Hardy. It was amazing to join um, a company that had a very different kind of culture from, from the other companies I'd, I'd worked for. And I learned a kind of totally different way of thinking about what a business is and what products are, even to some extent. And so we ended up making collaboration tools for engineers that are kind of like mm -hmm. what we would call in the industry PDM systems, data management systems, but we made them fun, online. I, I, nowadays, this seems kind of obvious, but the idea of doing a, like Google Hangouts barely existed when we got started. We were the first. That was the first product that had a precise solid modeling kernel on the cloud that you can do precise measurements on models. So we built this awesome data management tool. And then something really funny happened. Stratasys, and I deeply, deeply admire the leaders of Stratasys for making this decision. I think it's, it's a real challenge. They said, hey, our industry, to make our, our 3D printers more, more, more available, to, sort of, to, to, do, to do more things with them, we need better software applications. And also, the company happened to have been sort of five different startups that had kind of merged together but never really integrated. And they knew they needed to integrate. And I think they've been putting off. So we're going to integrate the company through software. Mm. Now, you know, the, so there are a couple, you know, there's some challenges with, with a story like that. You, you have a, a new team that has to go around and meet all these people. But it was, it was a wonderful experience. Stratus has welcomed us in. Uh, a team of us went to every site. We learned about their problems. We told them about what we did. And we formed a new organization, a new software organization. So that, GrabCAD was able to be the, the conversational platform within Stratasys that ended up uniting the different teams. Exactly. We, had, we, we, we were good at multi-site collaboration. GrabCAD was founded in Estonia. Um, we had, we, our headquarters moved to Boston. We also had a site in Cambridge, England, which is a good place to have a, a, a CAD team. Um, and we had a... Really, this, 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 this network of both sort of IT experts on the cloud side and, and CAD experts is a really good team. John Stevenson put together a phenomenal team. And this uh, seems like a really important essence to any community that's being built in whatever industry is. If there's a missing piece of community, then you'll not, you won't actually be able to maximize the potential of the software or the tools that you're trying to build or the impact that you're trying to make or people actually using that to build things. There's all these aspects of communication that have to come into play, and uh, having a community platform within uh, software, especially 3D printing software, is so important. All the different ones that exist out there. So, it, are they now able to communicate with one another? Certain 3D printing software with other 3D printing software, can they communicate? Can different CAD models now CAD platforms communicate as well? That's exactly what we did. So, so yeah, so, so we, we sort of took our, the, the, what, what Stratasys did is they took the GrabCAD culture and they allowed us to sort of broadcast that wider in the organization so we could bring in the, all the other software teams around. And you know, businesses evolve and change and we ended up focusing on some things other than other things. But we, we created an integrated platform that supports all of our printing technologies. And probably more importantly, we, we improved access by Today you have to go through a kind of cumbersome process or you had to where you would export weird clunky formats that are outdated and then bring them in and lose a lot of information. And we started working with CAD vendors and partners to directly read the CAD information in a much higher fidelity way, removing some awkward steps. So we, we've come up with a much smoother process where you can work with your precise CAD parts and you kind of get the results you expect. And then, so what is Stratasys then right now? What would you call it? The largest additive manufacturing, the largest 3D printing company? What's the difference between 3D printing and additive manufacturing? So, I'm not a marketing person. Um, I, I, Stratasys is probably the, the, the leader in, in polymer additive manufacturing. Plastics. Plastics. Um, and we also have a lar one of the largest service bureaus, a global service bureau, where we have all the 
all, all normal additive manufacturing technology is even some subtractive. So we, we make a lot of parts, we ship a lot of parts in addition to making the machines that make, make parts. So you make the machines that make parts and then you also make parts. We all, yeah. We, and so when we, you make them, you make them normally throughout history, we've made them in a way that you would take one gigantic hunk of metal or whatever material it is and then you would carve out the piece that you need and that would be subtractive manufacturing exactly because you're taking those corners or whatever pieces away and then you're scrapping them and recycling them and then there's the additive manufacturing which is where you just make the one piece that you need uh, over and over again so that there's no scraps that need to be subtracted every single time yeah I, I mean yes exactly additive yeah you, you waste less material in in most processes um, but producing that material may be a little more complicated. And because you have to make a mold for every single time, is that true? Or you can 3D print it where you don't need a mold, but you need just the CAD file that enables you to print in that three-dimensional space without a mold, but the mold is kind of the CAD file. So well, that's actually a really good example. I mean, if we just take a, um, a simple, normal sort of plastic part, like the case for your, your, your phone or something like that, um, you're going to have two, at least two pieces of steel that come together. So you have to get these pieces of steel. You got to machine them. It's a lot of stuff, and those things cost, you know, in the thousands to tens of thousands of dollars for for, for small ones. Um, and then you're going to shoot plastic into them over and over again to get parts out. And that's relatively inexpensive, but there's a huge initial cost and a lot of wasted material. So if you just want one or two parts, that's not practical. With 3D printing or additive manufacturing. You just get the part you want. Sometimes we print some support structures or some other sort of scaffolding to make it possible, but it's, it's a much more efficient process. And so for different parts and different you know, technologies, you're going to have some trade-off curve for, for quantity. Um, you also asked about the difference between 3D printing and additive manufacturing. That's really a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. I think that 3D printing is usually refers to the more consumer type, fun, MakerBot-like 3D printers. That, that just you know that you see at schools and and um, it, it's it's sort of, it, it kind of refers to the low end of the market and additive manufacturing tends to refer to the mm. high end and sure. there's a lot that comes along with that process management quality control um, the concept of things like allowables which means how many of the ones you make are allowed to be bad you know for aerospace parts you know, with, you, you, there, there's a lot of requirements around that. And the, the initial applications in additive manufacturing, really the high end, we see in aerospace defense and automotive because that's kind of the nature of, it, of the industry. Okay, so the most applications right now in the additive manufacturing industry are in aerospace and automotive? Um, the, the ones that have the most rigor around mm -hmm. the part creation. Mm -hmm. You know, when you fly on an airplane, you don't want it to break. Yep. And, and, uh, and the, the, the FAA has these regulations that say what you're allowed to do to put parts on airplanes. And the quality standards are, are significant. Airframe data, for example, you, you, need to demo, you need to be able to read that data for 100 years. That's a kind of interesting. I mean, computers didn't exist 100 years ago, yet people have, you know, so, so, so there are great challenges in, in making sure that we can build airplanes safely. And I'm, I'm thrilled that with our FDM technology, we can produce these parts out of a very fancy material called Ultem 9085. What's FDM? Um, deposition. So the type of 3D printers that have a little nozzle, like, like the low-end ones you see, yeah, yeah. Are, we invented the technology. Um, Scott Crump uh, founded uh, Stratasys with that technology 20 or so years ago, roughly. And so it's a nozzle that comes and builds it out from the bottom, pew, 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 upwards. Yeah. For anyone who's ever seen a 3D printer, it's highly likely you saw that one that's FDM, or sometimes they call it FFF, where it extrudes just a single bead. So, so our FDM machines are just like, 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 they're, they're way more than maker bots on steroids. They're, they, they, there's a lot of process stuff, control stuff that makes sure that when you're making a part, you're making the part you think you're going to make. Um, and for us, you know, we, we, the first uses of 3D printing and additive manufacturing were in, in prototyping. I have this idea in the computer. I want to hold it in my hands. We're going to make a shape very quickly. Where we're focused right now is, is, is evolving that technology to where we're making the best parts possible, not the shape as fast as possible. Okay. And are we... 
running a, you said, for example, with flight, it takes 100 years sometimes of testing to be able to know whether or not the part is most efficient for its what we're trying to use it for. So then are you running simulations on all these different types of parts? So, oh, we want to augment a airplane wing or the airplane engine or the airplane nose or whatever aspect of the plane or the automotive or whatever. Then you put that in simulations for a period of, it does a hundred flights a month or whatever. And then that's how you, uh, and you, that goes on for a hundred years. And then you try and see when does that part break down? Why does it break down? What aspect of it breaks down? How can we secure it so that it doesn't break down? So do you do that in the, in the testing as well in the simulating of these parts? That is actually one of my projects right now. So that's, personally, I'm, I'm in, invested in, in working on some of that. The reality is, is that we haven't, quite achieve the same kinds of tools that we've seen for other manufacturing processes. The additive parts have a lot of, um, a lot of detail inside of them, We're, and we can make microstructures and lattices that have very specific material properties. The tools mm -hmm. that had, have traditionally evolved to, to, to simulate the behavior of solid parts or sheet metal parts and things like that don't, uh, don't work as well as they should, or as we'd like them to, for these kinds of parts we're making. So we're working with uh, folks at Dassault System, uh, the Simulia folks on, they've, they've, they've been leading the way of a number of new approaches to simulating this as well as uh, there's a division of Hexagon. The MSC division has a, has a captive company called Extreme Engineering where they do phenomenal work on, on homogenizing the material properties so they can be used by more traditional solvers. Um, the folks at Siemens as well are working on it for some composite applications, other things we're doing. So. We, we, this is a problem that's bigger than, than just us, and because the, 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 these thermoplastics are so commercially useful, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of we're, we're working with a number of folks to achieve the same confidence building and validation steps for FDM that you have for other processes. That said, there are thousands of FDM parts flying on airplanes. You don't need to be able to simulate something Hmm. But it sure helps. So you can do destructive testing. You can you can make a thousand oh, sure. parts and be like, okay, we know how to make the parts. They work. We're going to trust the thousands and one. one. Yeah. And, and yeah. there are folks who are very good at managing those probabilities. A lot of aerospace stuff is managing the probabilities. All right. So let's go through from uh, beginning to where we are now as close as possible. So we have both the Stratasys makes the machines that print the parts as well as makes parts and sells those parts. Now, when you guys have a moment of, aha, we are gonna make a better printer for the parts or we're going to make a better part. When you go through that process, does the team sit down with the designs and engineers and, and collaborate and figure out what's the best way to make this and then you go through a series of actual testing inside of the team inside of your headquarters or your testing facilities and you go through a process of iteration to see if this part's gonna be able to hold up or if the printer's gonna be able to work well. And then and only then you release that piece or printer to the world because you know there's a market demand for it and so that's why you're making it in the first place as well. So is that generally about how you guys work? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, usually you perceive a market need and you come up with some requirements and then you give that to the engineering team and they're like, we can't do this. And eventually you get to a point where it's something they can do and it's awesome and then you take it to market and hopefully it comes r roughly on time. I, I, I work on the software side. I could talk a lot about software engineering. I Definitely. don't know about, I, I've watched with awe what the hardware folks do. But I'll tell you a little story about sort of what I think is a pretty awesome thing those guys did. So we, 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 we noticed that there was that, that there was a problem with, with some of the parts that every once in a while, a little bit of plastic would kind of stick to the head and drop into the part. So you get a little bit of burnt plastic yeah. in your part that doesn't have as good of material properties as yeah. the rest of the part. And that defect That's is true. not okay. Yeah. I remember that. Um, so we needed to solve that problem. And I'm not sure I can say how we solved that problem, but it was a, a shockingly simple mechanical thing. It's like you do. just got a from the nozzle that's pointed downward, you just gotta cut. You have to have something that just cuts rather than stop. If you stop, if you stop it, then it'll drip down and burn that last part. But if you cut it somehow, or if you seal it really tight, then maybe you can get it to prevent that burning. 
That's a cool you're, you're problem. On the right, you're on the right track. So, it's a cool so problem. W- the problems you were talking about we solved a long time ago with 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 various different ways of doing the toolpath and sucking back the tool, the, the oh. plastic and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. yeah, but but the thing about the stuff, anyhow, the, what we had to do. To, so the thing is that this created a problem of most parts were okay, but the the variability wasn't wasn't good enough, right? We, we need a certain percentage, you know, B basis allowables, roughly two standard deviations. Um, you know, that's what we needed to hit. So we were right at the threshold. We knew that if we could remove those occasional random defects, we would do it. And so what the team, the engineering team did is they performed a root cause analysis and they spent a ton of time watching prints and they could figure out exactly what was happening. And then they had an idea for how to fix it, maybe more than one, but eventually they, they were able to demonstrate that they resolved the problem. And that process probably took a few years. Like that was a really deep exploration um, with an incredibly simple solution in the end. And so one of the things that, I, that engineering teams do is rather than sort of have theory and arguments, you perform a very exhaustive root cause analysis and sort of make this tree of anything that could have gone wrong until you get to the exact nub of what it is. And then you know exactly what you have to do to be successful. And I, I, it, it was really awesome to watch the team and our team in Minneapolis do that. Definitely. Yeah. And so Minneapolis and Israel based. Yeah. Okay. And then on the software side of things, on the software research side of things, uh, currently, what are you? Because you were saying that you're part of you, part of your research right now is in simulations at Stratasys. But then, also, what are these other aspects of, of software research? Where are we going with software with within three D printing? Well, well, the the big trends and just just in in, in the industry. Um, so we talked a lot about sort of validation. Uh, simulation that's a big trend yeah there's sort of a, a, a the, the sort of the, the back end of that is traceability um, monitoring uh, recording what's going on to, with the machine so one the data has got to be right but also you have to make sure the machine's healthy and it's being serviced properly so there's a lot around that mm-hmm. in the high end um, for, for, for for those machines there's a lot going on in terms of, like I said before, ease of use, where we're trying to make it more accessible, be able to print directly from your CAD system. Ha- we're working with CAD vendors to put tools in the CAD system so you, when you're designing things, you can make the most of the additive technology rather than getting to the point where you make and you're like, oh, that, if I just done this a little bit different, it'd be a much better part. So moving yeah. upstream in the design process. Um, right now, if, if you want to you know, take advantage of lattice structures, you know, when you make parts, you know, you've seen engineering drawings, the, the mechanical version of a blueprint. They, this type of Lattice document. as in we're talking about what's on the interior yeah. of the object. One of the benefits of additive manufacturing is you can make parts that vary in density and vary in material properties. Um, the thing is that CAD systems today, for the most part, only let you specify a, a part of sort of uniform density. And there are some techniques and tricks you can use. You can split up into multiple bodies and, and sort of label them with different different information, but then if you want to make a drawing of that, it doesn't come out right. It did, the, the, the CAD tools for design and documentation just haven't quite caught up with the manufacturing technology. And so there, it's a very interesting problem because mm-hmm. engineers want to specify material properties as a function of space. This is where I want it strong, this is where I want it lightweight. Maybe yeah. you know, there are folks around here talking about things like oxidic materials, which means that usually when you when you squish something, it squeezes out, but instead it's you squish something and it also squeezes in. Oh, that's crazy. Or when you heat it up, it doesn't expand. What? So, so and, and there, are, there are all sorts of amazing applications of these kinds of materials. So, so, so we can make these things and vary it, but how do you explain that? And a simple analogy, like when you print, um, you know, you want to print, say, a purple rectangle and you do that on a laser printer. That laser printer is using some sort of half-toning or dithering to mix cyan and, and magenta to give you the color purple you asked for. What you have to do in additive manufacturing today is say, what colors of purple can my printer make? I'm gonna print all these different lattice, pa- or inner, different half-tone patterns of different cyan and magenta and see all the different colors and then sort of color by number and figure out which one it is. It's totally backwards. And but you know, before mechanical engineers said, I'm making this part out of 61, 61 T6 aluminum. These are the mecha- mechanical properties. When I machine it, it's still 60, 61 T6 aluminum, if I did it right. And therefore, I know the properties of it. But now, it's like, just, so, so CAD tools haven't really grown up yet to, to be able to have that. And quite frankly, we're still developing the language, which with, you can specify that kind of information. So we're working very closely with CAD vendors to make sure that people can describe what they want to make rather than describing something that's close and then sort of fudging it in the end. 
Yeah, and it seems to be a common theme across industry is that the engineers, uh, the, th the whatever that has been built, in this case a 3D printer, is running off and doing all these different types of printing for so many different people, but the actual logging and the, the trying to figure out how to make the design tools better and all that stuff takes a backseat because everybody's trying to run off with the technology and use it in all these different ways. Similar is happening across biology and neuroscience and all these other industries right now. Um, let's talk about biomimicry. Yeah. So, yeah. So, tell us a little bit about how you guys are assisting with surgeons and with cadavers. This is interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, replacing cadavers. Yeah. So, um, the so we talked about one. Stress has 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 two main product lines in polymers. One is the FDM process we've been talking about. The other is um, so FDM is a thermoplastic process where you heat it up, it gets melty, and then you cool it down, and you have the same properties again. Thermosets are like epoxy where it cures once and then when you heat it up it doesn't melt again. And, and, and so um, our polyjet machines are incredibly beautiful and, and detailed machines that can create some absolutely gorgeous models. They're, we do full color printing with transparency. Hmm. They, they create absolutely gorgeous things. The way that works is there's a, an industrial inkjet head and it lays down individual voxels of material. So if you imagine space divided into a 3D grid, every cell of that grid gets one kind of material. And these machines yeah. can print eight different materials. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at sort of, the, if you buy one of these machines today, it'll have um, a set of colors and, and different resins and you can do hard and soft and that's kind of cool. Um, one, one, one project I've been thrilled to be able to contribute to. Is there is, a human body option? Well, that's what we've done. <laughs> So we've come up with a new family of materials that reproduce the properties of flesh and bone. And also some other things that you need to a do. A family of materials. So this is like skin and, and whatever is under the skin, the next layer, the little more muscle or a little bit of bone, a little bit of... It's even better than that. How? So the architecture is very similar to the architecture of the body. If you want to... It's biomimicry, right? So what is our, our body is made of cells, and those cells uh, combine into tissues. The tissues combine into organs. The organs combine into organ systems. And so that's what we did with biomimics. We have materials, and each voxel of material is kind of like a cell that has oh, its own yeah. properties. And then we have what we call digital materials, which is a, a, a dithering of those across space, where we can vary those material properties. So. Um, I, 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 we haven't announced the details of what these materials are. Right now, we're not selling a printer that makes these. We're selling the parts as we're, as we're getting started. Oh, you're we, selling we, the parts, not the yeah. printer that makes the cadaver yet. Well, we're, we're, well we, 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 we do make those. They're the same printers as we have. But mm. when, when, to, when you sell a printer in a material system, there's a lot of stuff like life cycle things. You know, heads wear out over time and of customers course. expect to get it. You know, so it may be the material. I, um, this is not the case, but the kind of thing that might prevent us from shipping a material would be that it's wearing out the head life, so we have to do more development there. So the first output of this project, and I, who knows what will come after, mm -hmm. but the first output is a couple different kinds of parts. We're specializing in sort of muscle and bone type anatomies, long bones, short bones, doing a lot of work with vertebra, straightening spines and that kind of thing. I explain how that works. And then also blood vessels if you want to go in and do sort of the, 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 the things where you're going into some very special sort of blood vessels and practicing that. Because so you're idea, trying to clear them out. Yeah. yeah, there's a bunch of different practices for that. So, so our biomimics project is about enabling doctors to learn how to perform new surgical ap operations without requiring an expensive cadaver. Yeah. The goal is to improve the, lower the costs of, of being able to learn and deploy new surgical techniques. Um, a, a good example of that uh, awesome. is um, well, one of the first applications is for, um, for, for spine straightening. And I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm, I'll screw up the medical terminology. but. What you do is, if someone's spine is, is, is crooked for various reasons, you put in what are called pedicle screws into to the vertebra, along several vertebra, and then there are titanium rods that the screws tie into. And so the tricky part of the skill there is the surgeon needs to know exactly where in the bone to drill. And, and there are a couple of operations. It's a lot like machining. First you drill a pilot hole, then you drill a hole to size, and then you come in with a tap and tap the threads, and then pedicle screws, and it's really cool tools to, to do all mm -hmm. this stuff. But so, the, so what we had to do 
is make a vertebra that's just like, that feels to a surgeon who's performing, performing these machi sort of machining operations on it like the real thing. And so there was all this work we, we did to, to, to make sure that the bone would, when, when, when you turn, it's just like the real thing. And it's amazing to watch doctors work on these plastic parts. Um, and, and then give us feedback on whether it feels real or not. And then we're going yeah. back and we're creating new materials or new, more often patterns of materials, these sort of digital tissues, I like to call them, uh, to, to, wow. to, to, to get it right. Like when we first did the, ver the vertebral stuff, they were really happy with the bones, but the discs we were just doing like with solid rubber material we hadn't worked on. It's like, they're like, this is junk. They're like, it's supposed to be like crab meat, crab meat. Okay, just come out in chunks. We're like, okay. So we came up with a whole, a totally new kind of, of noisy lattice pattern that might work and we took it back to them and they're like yeah this is great so so we're, we're working with doctors to figure out how to take this sort of new family of materials that have different squishinesses and softness even yeah. liquids that, that that can all kind of work together to form these organ systems this is one of the many nodes in this space that's moving forward of of healthcare. so there's all the companies that are working on uh, printing organs, there's companies that are or actual organs that will work inside your bodies, there's companies that are intuitive surgical with surgical robots um, so that you guys can potentially provide them with cadavers for surgeons to practice on. It's This is really cool to be able to digitally print uh, tissue, set up a CAD file of what you want your cadaver to look like uh, and over time figure out the squishinesses, the textures of these tissues, what will actually work well for the specific surgeon on what part of the body are they operating on. I'm really glad that this is a, it's a it seems to be a very applicable field and applicable use of this to an everyday person. Because the other stuff about maybe automotive or airplane seems like it's a little bit further away from people, but even that is so applicable to us because we always take cars or planes to places and that has everything to do with all of the engineers and designers that have to go through the steps of using software to test it over time to run simulations on it to see uh, are we going to print this are we going to sell you a printer that then the car company will use to print these pieces or are we going to print the parts here and sell it to the car company so this is a beautiful ecosystem that i think needs to be explained even better for the world to care more about it 3D printed additive manufacturing. This is probably one of, you know, I think it was about five years ago or so that I was initially, like I was saying with the Apple thing, watching the Apple be printed. And that was a big aha moment for me, the seeing that this is possible today, now, and that was five years ago. And what have we made since then? So many crazy um, steps forward. So I'm really happy that we're able to sit down and talk. Is there, is, there, is there another aspect of Stratasys that you think would be important to, or another aspect of additive manufacturing that we should be aware of? Well, you know, it, so it's a hot new technology. And whenever you have something new, you know, people get excited about it. I think all, you know, all technolo you know, technologies are, aren't really good or bad. And, you know, you, we, we all want to make the world a little bit, you know, leave our impact on the world and hopefully make it a little bit better. I'm working in manufacturing. There's only so much that you can do. But what I like about Stratasys is that we're really connecting to applications that, 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 that make a difference in products. You know, the biomedical stuff kind of has an obvious impact on people's lives and, you know, and, and, and you know, individual patients that doctors can practice on. That, that will change lives. And, and, it's, yeah. it's, and that's wonderful to be part of. But my inner, inner geek also really enjoys the fact that we have gone to a place in polymer manufacturing where no one else has gone. And I like to think that that will help people create more efficient products, better solutions, use less fuel and resources, even if additive manufacturing is a little more expensive up front that we can make better products. And um, you know, I, for me, as, as we talked before, I, I, I woke up one morning and as a, as a company we'd become part of Stratasys. And, I just want to say, I, 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 it, it, the Stratasys did a heck of a thing, made a real to, to bring us in and, and ask us to work on these problems, and I'm really glad they did. Yeah, I'm glad too. I think the whole community is glad. So maybe you give us a glimpse. What do you think, three, five-ish down years down the line, maybe even ten years down the line, are we going to have 
the 3D printers at our houses or are we going to be still ordering from companies like Stratasys because it's going to be cheaper, kind of the whole Amazon model. Um, I still order my spinach rather than growing my spinach at my house. So what, what do you think? If I'm like missing a button on my jacket, right? What am I going to do? Print it myself or get it ordered quickly? So when I was growing up, my dad told me I could have anything I wanted as long as I made it myself. Um, and we spent a lot of time making stuff. I, that probably has something to do with why I became a mechanical engineer. Yeah. Um, I have CAD tools. I, 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 I'm constantly designing printing parts, learning it. I, I, I'm swimming in, in, in everything. I, it, it, I'm fully absorbed. That's me. But if I didn't have access to 3D printers, I'd be doing it with wood, and plexiglass, some of my favorite materials. So yeah, I got a 3D printer at home, and I got tons at work, and I'm using them all the time. I think I'm going to do that. There's a huge number of people that are going to do that. Now, there's sort of the next phase um, of, you know, you know and, and like Ping was talking about, where we, you know, can we, put, can we you know, put 3D printers for food in people's houses and improve their quality of life? That's a pretty, that's a pretty neat idea. Um, but, but I, so I think that, that 3D printing will become and it will gain mind share from sort of the home shopper crowd and maybe there'll be you know, fewer milling machines at home and more 3D printers at home. But that's just a trickle down. We, you know, we're going to see the same thing in machine shops. You know, instead of just having subtractive machines, we're going to see more additive machines making carbon fiber parts to replace metal parts on jigs and fixtures of just standard industrial machines. You know? So, so I think just we're going to see that for the for the people who like to make things or it's their job to make things, more and more additive technologies will be the appropriate or the cool thing to do, and that's where it will be. Now, will we all have Star Trek replicators someday? Sure, but I can't connect the dots to that right now. Yeah, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Blake. Thanks so much. This for has been today. super fun, uh, guys. If you had a good time, please give our content a like, comment, subscribe. Uh, please share it with other people. Let's get more people talking about additive manufacturing and the importance of that in our world. Um, let's get more people talking about the importance of surgeons practicing on, ca on cadavers. That's super cool stuff. Um, and we'll be on very shortly right after this with Spiros. So thank you very much for tuning in and thanks Kofaz, our producing partners of this event. And thanks Ron Vargas, our producing partner in the back. Thank you. All right. Awesome.